Wherezilla's Retrospective. I'm your host, Wherezilla. As promised, we're going to be looking at something that celebrates the release of a movie that holds some very special importance to me next week. The Power Rangers movie. I don't remember if I mentioned this when I did a Let's Read for Super Sentai vs. Power Rangers, but when it comes to where I started watching the show, sadly it wasn't at the very start in 1993. But how could I really? I was only a year old at the time. I started watching around Season 8, Lightspeed Rescue. Naturally, of course, I kept watching during Time Force and Wild Force, and if not for the switch from Fox Kids over to the Disney Channel, I might have actually kept going watching into Ninja Storm. But a few years later, that didn't stop me from checking out the current season, SPD, as well as the Jet X reruns of the original Zordon era seasons, giving me a bigger picture of what most people expect when they think of Power Rangers. And I liked what I had to see, especially Season 3 of Mighty Morphin and In Space, both of which felt like the culmination of everything that happened before, both the silliness and the more serious drama, the memorable episodes and the lackluster ones, all leading up to this with natural consequences and ongoing storylines. Point is, there is some merit to this franchise, and the creation of this new movie is a pretty strong indication that I'm not the only one who feels that way. Because really, we deserve a good Power Rangers movie at this point. Because we haven't gotten one yet. While Power Rangers has had plenty of good on TV, even if you aren't actively following this show as it's gone on over the years and therefore haven't seen it, when it comes to the movies, Things haven't been so good. The first movie is mostly remembered for its armored-looking suits, the scantily clad warrior woman, and the shit GI Zords, which don't exactly help a story that was frankly better told in the show itself, which is why it's not canon to the series. The second film is easily worse, and not only just because it's a bad transition between Zeo and Turbo, but just as a movie, well, it would be mediocre for a made-to-TV movie, much less a theatrically released one. And Clash of the Red Rangers was a two-parter that tried to bill itself as a TV movie, which nobody fell for. So here's hoping next week's Power Rangers will be the good movie we've been waiting years for. Now you were probably expecting me to talk about the first movie, given the celebration of the new film, but really all I can say to that is just watch the Ninja Quest 4-parter that began Season 3 instead. It's more or less the movie done right on a TV budget with an actual bearing on the series. I cannot say the same thing, however, for Turbo, a Power Rangers movie. But wait, Wherezilla, you already reviewed this movie. Downvote and unsubscribe. Ugh, kind of an extreme reaction, but that is true. I did talk about this movie. In fact, it was the second review I ever did. It shows. I am the and that, children, is what trying too hard looks like. So what we're going to be doing instead is trying to come up with a new story and concepts to see if we can think of a better way as to how this movie could have been made, becoming a better transition between Zeo and Turbo. Now, enough setup. Let us begin. Just a quick recap as to what happened in the second film. Here's the basic plot. Instead of following up on Rita and Lord Zed's promise to return, a new villain steps up to the plate, Divatox who looks like this, and isn't very threatening, to be honest. A comedic villain would be fine, but unfortunately she's not very funny. She invokes more pity than anything else. Fortunately, in the Turbo movie at least, her goal is to unleash a more threatening monster, Malagor. The Rangers learn about this and prepare to stop her and save the wizard Larago, who is the key to her plan. With no explanation, the Rangers can't simply use their current set of Zeo powers and swords, instead need new Turbo powers and swords. Presumably it's because Malagor is on an island that can only be accessed by Larago and the Turbo Powers are supposedly created to mimic his abilities, but it's incredibly vague as to where these powers came from and, further hurting the film, Rocky, the Blue Ranger, gets injured while training for a fighting tournament earlier in the film. So in his place comes Justin, a random kid that the Rangers happen to know, also for vague, almost non-existent reasons. At least from an in-universe perspective. I'm aware Saban was trying to compete with, funny enough, themselves at this point, given how Big Bad Beetleborgs had a higher rating than Power Rangers at this point. The Rangers battle Malagor using the Turbo Megazord in one of the unique instances where Power Rangers films its own Zord footage. Malagor is defeated and Divatox swears revenge, setting the stage for Turbo. So if you've seen this movie, then you probably already know what's wrong with everything I just described, but for those of you who haven't, let's go through it bit by bit. First up is Zeo's Loose Ends. 
At the end of Zeo, the Machine Empire was defeated, but Rita and Zed had plans to return. The Rangers still have their powers, all of their Zords, all of their weapons, and while Jason is no longer the Gold Ranger, Trey is. In fact, out of the Rangers' entire arsenal, the only thing that was actually lost was the Zeo Jet Cycles. Everything else is intact. The plot could have given us a reason why none of these things could be used to battle Diva Talk's forces, but the film doesn't give a reason why these changes were made. But this is fixable, with a very simple change. Let Tommy, Rocky, Adam, Kat, and Tanya keep their Zeo powers, and give the turbo powers to TJ, Carlos, Cassie, Ashley, and Justin here in this movie, instead of 18 episodes into the season. I know that sounds crazy, it sure as hell was for the 86 Transformers movie to star all new characters, but and it could have gotten just as controversial of a response in the movie than it was in the show itself, but hear me out. After the switch in the show, the dynamic felt less stagnant, and the new characters fit into the turbo powers well, since the original roster frankly seemed out of place. It's a risk, but considering all these characters were well-received by the time we got to In Space, I think it could work. I'll come back to how this could be presented in the plot towards the end. The second issue comes in the form of the film's format. The movie simply doesn't know what events deserve focus. This is shown with A. Having Tommy and Cat wander through the jungle aimlessly. B. Sidelining Rocky in the first few minutes, and having almost no screen time both in general, but also with his successor, leading us to... C. Not giving Justin enough time for establishing his character, which considering he's new, he desperately needs it. D. The failed attempt by Jason and Kimberly to escape Divatox. I don't doubt they would try, but since they all ended up on the islands possessed by Malagor, it kind of feels like their scenes were just stretching the film's runtime. Probably goes to show how shallow their appearance in this film is when you could cut them out and lose nothing. Except for maybe the fight with Jason and Tommy, but as I said in my original review, it pales in comparison to their confrontation in the Zeo episode, King for a Day. And finally, E. The Rangers don't battle any of Diva Tux's forces until about 40 minutes in. And they don't morph until about an hour in. And their initial short fight with Malagor is so one-sided, it makes you feel like they were better off with their previous sets of powers. Not doing its job selling us to the new show. There's also Bulk and Skull's token appearance, which is part of a larger problem the season would have concerning having no idea what to do with them, so they're just sort of there. The movie needs more focus, and I have just a thing, but we'll talk about that in a second. The third problem with this movie is one the show occasionally dips into, but because this is a movie, it's much more noticeable. The villains and side characters have some decent characterization and clear motives, but the Power Rangers themselves do not, merely reacting to the villain's actions and don't move the plot forward themselves. The closest thing any of the active Rangers in this movie had to a character arc was Catherine back in Season 3 when she took Kimberly's pace as a Pink Ranger. And even then, that was more resisting Rita's influence and feeling guilty over being partially responsible for Kimberly injuring herself. But that doesn't really matter here in this movie, which you think would be given Kimberly's in the film, but nope! Nor does the Dear John letter she sent to Tommy get addressed either. And of course, the Rangers have almost no comment or discussion about Zordon arbitrarily deciding Justin will be taking Rocky's place on the team. you think that would lead to a character arc for Justin and to a lesser degree Rocky, but again, nope. When an opportunity comes by, a movie should never disregard it. And these were, if you will excuse the pun given Jason's presence in the film, golden opportunities. So how do you take all these negatives going against the movie and try to improve it? Well, here's one scenario I came up with. We open in a similar place the movie already does, a martial arts tournament involving Tommy, Rocky, and Adam, with Justin waiting in the wings, during which we cut to Cat and Tanya not on a bus full of kids, but rather the two of them on a bus that also contains TJ, Carlos, Cassie, and Ashley, where they exchange small talk with the new characters. Then suddenly, BOOM! Several monsters and an army of Piranatrons attack multiple locations in Angel Grove. And these monsters can be reused suits from throughout the show's run to save money, especially since this film would likely not use f Sentai footage. That budget could be spent on the Malagor costume and the Megazord fight at the end. This forces the Rangers to split their forces to battle the monsters, with the five new characters caught in the scuffle. This leads to each of the new characters getting a chance to help the Zeo Rangers, showing off their own martial prowess and willingness to step in and be heroes when the situation calls for it. The Rangers successfully defeat the monsters, but then Elgar and Rygog show up, knocking the Rangers of Brown, who are of course exhausted and worn out from the battle. Elgar goes over to, to Tommy to strike the final blow when TJ grabs his fallen Zeo power sword and slashes Elgar, 
while Carlos, Cassie, Ashley, and Justin tackle Rygog away from the other Zeo Rangers. Goldar and Rito show up to take the new villains away, and the Rangers are able to lick their wounds. Realizing that the villains are stepping up their game and attacking multiple fronts, the Zeo Rangers decide it's time to start dividing their forces as well, at which point Alpha and Zordon mention a secret project Billy was working on before he left the team. It's already a popular fan theory that Billy created the Turbo Powers in secret, so why not use that? However, instead of taking on the Turbo Powers themselves, the Rangers decide to pick the five new characters to become a second team of Rangers so they can handle taking on multiple villain threats at once. A good chunk of this movie afterwards would be devoted to training the Turbo Rangers how to use their powers, creating the new Zords, and perhaps more importantly of all, give us some proper development for both teams. This way we can establish a new dynamic while giving us some good action. We could have TJ wanting to live up to the Power Rangers he looked up to all his life, Carlos would struggle with balancing both being taught by Adam but also his soccer aspirations, Cassie would learn being a Power Ranger is its own reward, Ashley would be struggling with her optimism in the face of a difficult task ahead of her, and Justin would have his distant relationship with his father in the back of his mind, making him lose focus. And yes, I seriously just suggested making a Power Rangers film a character study. Of course, while all this is going on, Rita and Zed send out their latest lieutenant, Divatox, in search of Malagor in the hopes of leveling Angel Grove once and for all. Of course, this confrontation happens out in the woods where Rocky is training Justin, and as a result, they learn of the villain's plan. Realizing they have to work fast, it's Cassie who comes up with the idea to stall Divatox forces by directly attacking the moon base with the Turbozords. Using super speed that only the Turbozords are capable of reaching, which the plot will take the time to establish, she, Carlos, and TJ man make their way up to the moon base and destroy it using the Turbo Zords, being both faster and more maneuverable than the giant monsters defending it. Unfortunately, it's here where Carlos discovers, by going through the wreckage, is that Malagor is actually in another dimension, and Diva Tox is already on her way there. And Rita and Zed have sent out yet another monster army to attack Angel Grove. Once again, it's the Rangers who decide that what must be done. The Zeo Rangers will deal with the monster army while the Turbo Rangers go after Diva Tox. Again, using the Turbo Zord's ability to go super fast, the new team break through the dimensional barrier where Malagor comes from. Taking Divatox by surprise, Justin rigs her shuttle to self-destruct so she can't escape. With a little extra help from Bulk and Skull, who had earlier in the film snuck onto the shuttle in one last attempt to find out their Power Rangers' secret identity. However, this gets Malagor's attention, and as he battles the Rangers, he uses his telepathy to take control of the Turbo Zords. During the battle, Ashley attacks Divatox, distracting Malagor long enough for TJ to get inside his Zord and simply run Malagor over. This only pisses Malagor off, and he grows to giant size. The Rangers then form the Turbo Megazord and defeat him once and for all. And for bonus points, they leave Divatox behind in the alternate dimension when they leave. She does get rescued by Rita and Zed, but now has to prove her worth by destroying the new Turbo Rangers, who she naturally swears revenge against. And then the movie would conclude with the Zeo Rangers congratulating the Turbo Rangers a job well done, and even introduce Alpha 6 since they already had the costume made, no need to give it to Alpha for no reason, and reassure the audience that while the Turbo Rangers are the ones the show will be focusing on from this point forward, they can always call on their old friends and mentors should the need ever arise, as well as giving approval from the old cast, which helps ease the transition for the audience, as well as address the personal criticism I have of the show itself. It's always bothered me when a ranger team defeats their enemies, they go their separate ways and more or less retire, rather than continue on as a team of rangers facing off against new foes, albeit off-screen while the show focuses on a new team. I don't know if this bothers anyone else, but it's part of the reason why I feel Turbo, a Power Rangers movie, would be better formatted as such, being both a send-off for the Zeo Rangers and an introduction for the Turbo Rangers, the kind of ending that could serve as another beginning that I hope that someday Power Rangers will do as well. Oh, and I figured this one without saying, but just make Justin the same age as the rest of the new Rangers. I mean, he's written like a teenager, the characters don't treat him any differently, and really his thing with a distant father could have worked just fine regardless of his age. Let the kid hero things stick to Big Bag Beetleborgs. Now what did all of that have to do with the next week's Power Rangers film? Well, look at it like this. On the surface, it's easy to dismiss this franchise as something fun, but dumb. And, well, it is. But like any work of fiction, it can be something more. From what we can tell, that seems to be the viewpoint of the filmmakers for the up-and-coming movie. Our early concerns of the powers would be downplayed in the film have been rectified by layered trailers, showing off the rangers in costume and piloting their zords more prominently. 
We got to see what Alpha looks like, and it's much better than the Gort look they were going for in concept art. Rita looks more like later villain Drakina than her old self, but I don't think they would get away with the Space Witch look in this day and age. And, do we see Zordon in these trailers? You're goddamn right. I am genuinely hopeful for this movie, just as I was for Kong Skull Island, which as you may already know if you follow me on Twitter and Facebook, hint hint, I thoroughly enjoyed. So here's hoping Power Rangers gets a similar reaction. It... Oh right, I don't have a physical copy of this movie to put on my shelf. <laughs> Oops. I don't think we're gonna run into that problem next week though. Not when we have something... derivative, inherently flawed, and appropriately draconic.